right in the middle of my screen at the top. It's genius. Oh, dear me. Hey. Right, okay, we're recording. So, uh, so yep. Let's... Right. Over to you, Michael. Hello and welcome. This is uh, an interview with Michael Millward interviewing both uh, Mark Foster and Jim Reese, who are two elite athletes. And this interview has been conducted for the CIPD HR Leaders Network and is kindly sponsored and supported by Shorebird RPO. Um, you can find out more information about Shorebird at uh, shorebird-rpo.com. And if you want to find out more about Michael Millward, that's me, you can go to michaelmillward.co.uk. Now, hello, Mark, Richard, Hi. welcome. Thank you. We are recording this um, interview over the internet and we have people in three different locations around the United Kingdom. Uh, so we have got, uh, we're in the hands of the technology gods in some ways, but we've tried and tested it to a great extent. Um, what we're going to be looking at is a, an idea which is called Eight Steps to World Class Performance, which has been developed by Mark and Jim based around the successes which they have achieved in their various different um, sporting endeavors. Many of you may know Mark Foster because he's now the face of BBC Sports Swimming Commentary. Um, but Jim, you might not be that well known to people. What is it that you've done? Uh, I've, done a few, I've done a few things. I'm, I'm probably best known uh, for a thing called the Race Across America, um, which is an ultra cycle race uh, starting in Oceanside, California and finishing uh, 3,000 miles later in Annapolis, Maryland. Uh, so you have to finish the race within 12 days. So it's a pretty sort of grueling race. And I've done that three times as a solo rider. Um, and I've got the, um, the shiny legs to prove it as well. <laughs> I, will, I will let you explain that on a different day, um, what, what the shiny legs are all about. Mark, can you give us a summary of your sporting career? Uh, yes, I, I um, started off at a very young age and learned to swim like everybody else. Yeah. Um, and before I knew it, I was the fastest swimmer in the world for my age, by the age of 11. I made the national senior team, became senior record holder, the fastest swimmer in the UK at 15, and then represented GB at senior level for 23 years representing in 50 freestyle and 50 block butterfly. And on my way, I, I won the World Championships six times, the European Championships 11 times, the Commonwealth Games twice, and broke the world record eight times and go, went to five Olympics. Cool. cool. There are That's not many a people... Lot time, a lot of time in water, you, should, you could say. Yes. Well, well done. Congratulations to both of you. I don't think um, many people are aware that um, you're the fastest swimmer at age 11. But um, I'm impressed. I am impressed. Well, that's, that's for 11-year-olds, though. Not not in the world. That would be really exciting. All right. Okay. But, um, yeah, but at that age group. Thank you. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's, um, yeah, I wasn't that fast myself. Right. <laughs> eight steps to world-class performance. Um, eight steps. Why eight? It's like... There must be something about that. But let's investigate these a little, in a little bit more detail. What we're going to do is look at how this idea was developed across the eight steps based upon sporting success and then look at how those might translate into a business environment, which obviously is what um, we're all about and how things develop. So um, first of all, uh, the eight steps, Mark, Jim, are there any um, prerequisites that we need to do beforehand, or can we just go from one to eight, or how, how does it, or how do we get to to point one, the start point? I'll let Jim go for it. Okay, well, the first step uh, is a fairly obvious one, and if you um, if you look at all the gurus and the Buddhas of uh, you know history, it, it the the biggest one is that you need to know yourself. So that's step one. Um, to mm -hmm. be able to know yourself and know the, your own patterns of behavior that uh, you run as a human being or patterns of behavior that run you, um, you know, that you may not be aware of. So this is all about awareness and awareness of the fingerprint that you leave in every interaction that we have with others. So um, this is a, a lifelong journey. Uh, the know yourself piece is a, is a huge part of the coaching world. And of course, of, of leadership as well, and and certainly played a massive role in Mark's career, which uh, and and of course my 
um, I wouldn't say elite sporting career, but certainly in my my career um, you know, as, so a, Mark, as an athlete. Yeah, Mark, when is the t sort of time that you you know yourself is that being someone who is the fastest in your age group in the world and and has the potential to be an elite athlete? What um, sort of thing? I think at an early age, I didn't really, you know, I wasn't really aware of it. And I think Jim mentioned there a lot about awareness and, um, and a lot about mindfulness. And I think as a, as a child, you're just doing things and not really aware of anything else around you. We, we all know that. And when you look, look at children that people have or children we have, I don't have children, uh, you can see it, you can see it in them. But for me, um, a lot of this, a lot of the stuff is kind of like, like self-talk, you know. Right. What are you, what are you sort of saying to yourself? And I find it kind of interesting. We're all very quick to say we never talk to ourselves because everyone thinks if you talk to yourself, you're mad. But ultimately, yeah. we talk to ourselves more than talk to anybody else because that's if any if anybody thinks. Um, but the thoughts that things for me were is what I learned over the years was that I was very positive um I always uh stood there believing I'd get a good result and I didn't realize what I was doing at a young age but I just I just did it it was just one of my one of my habits um and when it when it comes to visualizing results it's thinking about uh, you know, generally people, if they're going to be, whether it be in sporting prowess or in an ex uh, office example of giving a presentation, you sort of know yourself and, and think about what you want to the outcome to be and always think that it's to be a, a positive outcome. And more often than not, you get a positive result. And an easy analogy here is, and I play a lot of golf, I don't know if anyone else does, but standing over the, the ball and there's water in front of you, how often do people go, oh, I'm going to go in the water? And more often than not, you do go in the water. Whereas if you think about getting over the water and hitting the green and doing a good shot, there's more chance that will happen. So visualisation is a big part of this. A lot of uh, uh, internal talk as well. Yeah, if we're talking about golf, we're going to get into negotiation skills and how you stand there negotiating with the ball as to where it will go and whether you can actually win or not with the ball. That's the first well, the quite Just interesting me. thing with golf is the fact that, that that little white thing just stays there looking back at you, whereas generally in, in sport, it's you react to something that's going on and you don't really get a chance to think. And I think golf's a wonderful example because you've got five hours of thinking. So you walk for a bit, look down at that ball and you've got to think and concentrate and focus and then let it go and off you go and walk again. But it's because the fact that that ball does not move, it's all about you and your movement. Whereas on the, on the, on the tennis court, you'll react to the ball wherever the other person hits it. So um, it's a lot of self-talk going on. Yeah. And it sounds as if there's an awful lot of understanding yourself within this mm. and what your what your strengths and weaknesses are if you know yourself but you actually well you know i'm not designed to be a swimmer i'm designed to be a rugby player but i really want to be a swimmer you're not going to be a success as successful a swimmer as you might have been a rugby player yes i, I think that, you know also when I mean, it comes a bit of into knowing what you want later on but um i mean we could I, I, listen i could i could say to you i want to be david beckham now yep. I can kick football and maybe I could have been a good footballer if I focused on it. But ultimately, I'm not going to be David Beckham. I'm not built to be a footballer. I would have been a very good... I might have been a good goalie, to be fair, because I'm good at diving, but that was a good pun. Um, but if you if you look at... <laughs> I'm made for basketball, rowing, long, lean levers. There'd be, there'd be events I would have been suited to. But I think at a very early age, I I kind of fell into into swimming which kind of goes a little bit into defining your purpose um yep. you know, my, my father uh couldn't swim got pushed in the lake um and nearly drowned at the age of 11 so he was determined myself and my sisters would learn for for safety reasons uh and only from that experience and him insisting that we go in the pool on sunday and he threw us around and we learned that the water was fun uh, and then went a step further and had swimming lessons. So I kind of fell into it in terms of another pun there. And uh, I fell into the swimming pool in terms of with his experience, he made us swim. I went along, had my swimming lessons and all of a sudden my purpose 
became defined for me. I, I literally, I fell into what I did, but also I found something I was good at. I, I, I loved and I was very passionate. And I think um, a lot of children, because they're, I can't sit still. So my mum was very adamant that she tire me out. So swimming was a, a, a fantastic outlet for that. Um, but yeah, no, defining your purpose, what do you want? Um, what do you want to achieve? What do you want out of life in general? Um, and one of the things throughout my career, which was quite evident to me, was uh, some of this happened uh, more out of luck than judgment, was surrounding myself with like-minded people. And I have a saying of fly with the eagles, don't peck with the hens. Surround yourself with like-minded people, people that have the same goal as you, same purpose, same energy. Um, and, and, and I fell into those things. At an early age, I fell into them. And then I, when I realised when I got older, I sort of gravitated towards people that were of the same mindset. Right. So it's that purpose aspect of it is you can have a skill, you can have all the knowledge and you can have the attitude, but purpose becomes much more of an attitude. So if I'm running a business and I need to recruit people who are going to share some sort of purpose around that, this it's like not so much hiring the best accountant, but hiring the best accountant for your business may be somebody with lesser skills, but actually is more passionate about it and buys into what you're trying to do with your organization. Would that be right, Jim? Yeah, it is. And I think it's actually even bigger than that. It's, um, you know, the engagement uh, stuff from Gallup uh, is the is the latest uh, stuff that we can look at globally. And uh, it's quite poor. The results are quite shocking, really. 24% of uh, staff globally are disengaged, you know, and that's, that's a huge amount of people uh, within it, within organizations that are actually disenfranchised. They're not uh, giving their di discretionary behavior. So, the key to actually getting people more connected, more engaged in their organizations is to actually have a compelling why. What is the purpose of that organization? What is the thing that drives people to jump out of bed in the morning and, um, and skip to work and uh, be really connected to the organization? So what is their bigger why of why they're in business what, and why they're doing it? So a lot of organizations are very good at um, establishing their vision and their mission but they don't have a compelling why, which is the basically the, the mind and the heart. And getting that connection is extremely powerful. And not many organizations are, are doing that really well. Is, is there an organization that you think is doing it well? I think probably the one that springs to mind for me is Johnson & Johnson through their credo. Um, and they've, been, they, they've had their credo in place for back in the 50s, I think they, uh, they set that credo out and they still pretty much live by that credo. And I'd say that's, that's got some elements of purpose without a doubt in there and they make decisions based on that. Right, that's so it's, it's almost like having the values that this is what we stand for as an organization, this is what um, we want to do, this is how we're going to fulfill it. Um, I won't ask you if there are any organizations which um, have got it spectacularly wrong. I'm sure people could um, make their own summations about that. But it's the purpose, it seems to me, if I, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to be like this is why we exist. This yes. is the, the hole that we're trying to fill in the world. Yeah, right? This it, is it's a deeper have. connection. Right. Sorry, say that again, please. It's a, it's a deeper connection, Michael. It's, um, the why drives your identity within your organization, the, you know, who you are as an as a individual within that organization, which then drives the values and the beliefs. So it's a cascade effect. So the why is the bit that drives your, knowing your purpose drives the identity that is formed and shaped within the organization, which drives the values, the beliefs, the capabilities, the behaviors and the environment. So it's, it's a model that cascades from purpose. That seems to be something that we witnessed at um, the Rio 2016 Olympics with the, the being a very clear, you know, with the funding from the National Lottery and then a very clear vision of what it was we were trying to achieve as GB and also as Paralympics GB with the um, the success that we've had and the the way in which everybody seemed to be going towards that we need to get this many medals, we need to get this many personal bests. You know, it, there's a, we can almost see over the, and surely, Mark, you must have seen over the time that you've been going to Olympics, both as a competitor and a commentator, the, the shift in attitude. In oh, the yeah, 
Yeah, Tim G, but there, there has been a shift, and that started. Uh, I mean, I've been around for a long time, but my first Olympics in 88, 92, 96, before lottery funding came in, we were really amateur sports people up against professionals. And after the 96 Olympics, when we only got one gold medal across the team, which was Red Raven Pinson, um, yeah. we looked and went, well, hang on, the only, reason, the only way to change this and be more competitive um, and this is defining our purpose about, you know, what do we want to achieve? That was to be further up the medal table. I think back then we were 12th, 15th, I can't remember, um, right. was to invest. And we were amateur athletes against professionals before because every other country had a, had systems and processes in place and we didn't. And then the money came in and uh, it gave us that um, funding needed to make athletes professional athletes. And it's no coincidence now that... The results we're getting is because of because of that investment. And that doesn't mean that you know more money necessarily mean better results. It it does reflect in that. Of course, it does. Um, and without the money, we don't get the right facilities. We don't get the right backup staff. We don't travel to the right places around the world. So yeah, it's no coincidence that when we focused on an end result, we started getting better results. Right. But I suppose also in a way because you got this vision. We got this organisation that wants to achieve these these very specific things. You can start planning. You can start saying, "We've got this amount of money. This is how we're going to spend it." Your actions almost become more focused. Yeah, it's you can do more. You do more. You work smarter as well as harder if you know what it is that you actually want to achieve at the end of the day. And, and in, yeah. in goal setting, I think that you know, I think what, what you know, knowing what you want what you do want to achieve in, in, in the long term. I think we all need long term goals and of course along the way we get lots of curveballs thrown and things change, but there needs to be short term, long term and I, I have a great saying about reaching for the stars. It's kind of cheesy, but reaching for the stars and if you reach for the stars you you know you might land on the moon, but if you only shoot for the moon you don't get off the ground. So I think in setting goals in all aspects of, of life, writing them down has been proven to work. And that's why peak performers um, follow processes. Um, for me, when I started out, I always wanted to be an uh, Olympic champion. Um, and I, I have been to five Olympic Games and I never achieved never achieved that. But by aiming that high, that's what, the reason why I had the longevity in the sport is I never stopped believing. Uh, and by aiming that high, that's why I, I know that I became world champion, European champion, co champion, became the fastest man on the planet because I, I believed something bigger was, was possible. Yes, I think there's um, that belief is very important. I think one of the things I remember from this games was Tom Daly's comments. Sometimes you just have a bad dive. Yeah. But and the other thing is you can be top of the leaderboard. You can be. You can be the fastest. You can be the best. You can be the strongest. Um, and I think one of the Olympic memories that a lot of people will have of you is in I think it was Beijing where you carried the flag at the opening ceremony. Yes. With one arm. Right. That was that. <laughs> That was uh, set the charge for everyone else, I think, going forward, whether everybody else could do that. But I think what you're talking about very much is like you have a vision, you have a, a goal, and you stick, you stay focused on that, and that becomes your reason for being. It's almost like we hear a lot nowadays about being authentic yeah. and what that means for people, and that's, uh, it's the, that's number four in your list. We're halfway through your sort of like eight steps. It's like being authentic. I mean... You said, you said talked about brickbats and you know if you're in the public eye whether you're in sport or business or any entertainment any field you will there will be people who tell you well you're wasting your time you know yeah. you, you, what is the problem with you people focus on the olympics and we don't get the same press coverage of the world games the european games or we don't get the same level of excitement about it how do you keep you know when you're doing things which are like you're the fastest in the world, but it wasn't at the Olympics and the vast majority of people don't realise it. How do you keep going when your big achievements it's like aren't on that Olympic stage and the majority of people don't really realise that what the, what you've actually achieved? Jim, do you want to shift a bit and I'll, I'll come in? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Say, say again, Michael. How do you maintain the authenticity of, of your objective? and you're working towards that objective when things aren't going well. It's very easy to be authentic about yourself when you think, like, yeah, I'm brilliant, everybody's fantastic, everybody's agreeing with me, everything's moving forward, and then all of a sudden it's not quite. And how do you maintain that authenticity? Well, authentic for me, and, and, and I've seen it in Mark as well, is 
is when people aren't looking. So, um, you know, that, that's all about, you know, step eight, which is staying committed and focused. But, um, and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. But being authentic is about being aware of the fingerprint that you want to leave, the legacy that you want to leave as an individual, whether that's in sport or in business or as a parent or as a brother, um, you know, within your family uh, dynamics. So um, being authentic is about, you know, seeing something through all the way. If, if you say you're going to do something, then you do it. So that being authentic is all holding yourself accountable to make sure that you actually do achieve those goals that you've set yourself. Okay. So first, um, I'm not down and then you're also then not letting others down that uh, uh, you know uh, attempting to support you okay you went a little bit muffled there so I'm gonna say, say hold it for a moment can you say that again just so that we've got it clearly for the recording please yes sure. so be, being authentic is um, pretty much about holding yourself accountable so you know when when people are looking you're you're still focused on your goals you're still aware that you want to leave a, a, a legacy and uh, it's the commitment to yourself really um, that helps you maintain that focus when when the rest of the world haven't got eyes on you so it's not just about when when perhaps the cameras are on mark or when he's at a big race um, it's about what he does behind the scenes that keeps him aligned so for example i just give you a quick work we typically talk a lot about work-life balance Yep. But interestingly, you know, if I'm a leader and I'm sending out emails late at night, I'm then giving the impression to the rest of my team and the organization that actually this is how I'm behaving and, and I actually do, you know, in a funny sort of way, in a roundabout way, expect you also to be working long hours as well. So does that make sense? It makes an awful lot of sense. It's about that sort of don't do what I do do. People don't do what they're told to do. They do what they see as being the, the route to being successful. If my boss behaves in this way, I will also behave in this way. If yeah. my boss plays the sport, I will also play the sport. You get on in the world, if you can have the non-work conversation with people, um, you've built you helps to build a bond there's no reason um, there's a comedy series on television called the smoking room I believe in some organizations if the boss smokes it's worth going in the smoking room every so often just to sort of like that's where he relaxes that's where he'll have the conversation that's where he'll let his, his um, face the front down so that you see the real genuine him uh, or her and I think yeah. that is when you talk about being authentic it's about maintaining the authenticity as you're saying, from the start all the way through to the finish. So it's like, you know, don't expect people to come in on time. If you're there an hour early, other people will follow your example. Um, and Mark be has examples as well. Sorry, Michael. Um, Mark has got loads of those examples as ambas you know, in his ambassadorial roles. And, and perhaps you might want to just mention a couple of them, Mark. Yeah, I've yeah. Got, um, the, the face of Wellman, which is a, a vitamin company. Um, they do lots of other vitamins, well woman, pregnant care, joint ace. Uh, but the Wellman brand is about vitamins for men and around health and well-being. So um, obviously having been an, an athlete for a number of years and been very, very clean living, I still maintain that now because I think that otherwise I'd be a complete hypocrite. Secondly, Wellman will want me to be the face of Wellman if I... I don't know, ate lots of pizza and drank lots of beer because that wouldn't be being all authentic. Um, another easy one is if you think of um, sport in general, or uh, I, I sort of lead by example by working hard and being the best that I can be uh, and going as fast as I can go. But you've got other people that will, you know, that will take drugs, so they'll. They would try and take a shortcut. They would try and cheat the system, and I think that's that's not really that. Well, that isn't being authentic, and I think we see a lot of that in in, in, in all walks of life and in all jobs, and that's quite evident in politics a lot of the time as well, which is an easy one to pick on. Um, so yeah, being authentic is um, leading by example and, and practicing what you preach. Right. I have a little thing like you have your table manners when you're out with people, but it's easier to maintain those if you're maintaining them when you're eating by yourself as well, as well. It's a very true. Thing. 
it's like you know if you if you eat if you add table manners at home by when you by yourself it's very easy to transfer those across um, be authentic be the person I'm waffling Richard will have to edit that bit out <laughs> no but I think also what, you, what you're saying there is it's quite interesting we're trying try to get people to change change their habits to good habits or healthy habits you know yeah. uh, ultimately you give them uh, healthy choices and, and that they do it for long enough after a period of time we don't have to think about it and then that's when when it all becomes easy when you don't have to think and all your all your traits are, are good traits none of us are a saint obviously but we can always we can always work on ourselves but that's interesting what you say there if you sit at home in front of the tv i don't know p- dropping food down yourself all the time and you go to a restaurant you're probably going to drop it down yourself again yes it's uh being authentic and, and moving forward. I think a lot of what we've been talking about so far is, is almost like the ideas behind it and it's like getting yourself ready. I think the the, the next stage really is the, is about the taking the action, right? And yep. you know, I like the image that you've got here is like, you know, you do have to take some sort of action, but also it's, you know, the planning stages that come into this and understanding the purpose of, of you can take an action without well, what we've been saying is you have to have a plan, you have to have objectives, you have to have goals, and the actions that you take have to be considered, I suppose, in order to, to reach those. You know? It's it's not just a case of jumping in the pool, you've got to know what it is you've got to do. And, and setting look- plans out, yeah, and, and, and then, the, um, I mean, nothing happens without without movement, and we can have a great idea of who who we are and what we want to do, but without taking action, stuff does not get done, especially the big stuff. So there's always processes that we need to enjoy as much as, as uh, some that are more fun and enjoyable parts of our jobs, but also learning. I think that sometimes uh, for me, um, you know, diving in freezing cold water at the end of the day at five o'clock in the morning when all my mates were still in bed um, wasn't enjoyable. Two hours of plowing up and down a pool wasn't enjoyable, but I knew to get the end result, I had to do that, that side. Um, and I think it's about building daily disciplines. That take you closer to achieving your goals. Right. So the the actions can be major things like we're planning to do this. This is the actions we're going to take. But the actions as well can be the habit things that we have to do. This the what I might almost call the washing up task. The things that you do to get back to where you started. Yeah. But you need those in order to move yourself forward. So you take one step backwards in order to move three stages further forward. Uh, becomes that much more important. I'm sort of, I've got this sort of thing going through my head at the moment, sort of thinking like, to be the fastest 11-year-old in the world, you did how many seconds in the pool, but how many hours were spent in the practice pool learning how to do that beforehand? You know, it's like yeah, and, and, and a big part of this, and I know we've, 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 this is a, it was or it still is a big buzzword of um, marginal gains and incremental improvements. Um, it's easy breaking my event down to 21 seconds ultimately when I became the world record holder, but breaking that race down into simple parts of the part behind the block, the part getting off the block, reacting to the gun, entering the water, and what I do underneath the water when I surface, stroke tempo, how many breaths or how many breaths I don't take, uh, and hitting the other end and finishing properly. If I, I, there's so many parts to 21 seconds and what I'm trying every time to improve by one hundredth. So what I do when I'm in the training pool or in the gym is do specific exercises to try and improve, make tiny, tiny, tiny improvements. Because ultimately, you know, 21 seconds is not a long time, but every time it's trying to chip away at a smallest, smallest point and improving every area, trying to make every area perfect, really. But that's why I say sometimes we're not good at, we're very good at doing the stuff we're good at doing because it gives us instant gratification and reward. But when we kind of put off the stuff we're not good at doing, and this is also about you know doing the don't you know don't put off the things until tomorrow that you can do today. That's very true. I'm sorry, seeing you on the webcam there, Jim, and you're nodding your head. So maybe you'd like yeah. to say something. Yeah, well, Mark, Mark became extremely good. That was one of the things that you know, as as mates over the years that we've discussed, is that he became really good at doing some of those things that we don't enjoy doing. I mean. A beautiful work example is expenses. So many people, millions of people out there don't like doing their expenses. They put it off, they put it off, they put it off. The interesting thing is when we've done them, we feel so good about it. You know, so it's about doing those processes that we don't necessarily enjoy doing and taking action on it. So it's about leaning into the process 
and, and, and also maybe even knocking one of the big jobs off first thing in the morning so that you've got momentum for the rest of the day. Right. Yeah, so it's, it's almost like we are taking, I suppose, personal responsibility as well. That's the next step that you have on your on your um, model. The um, eight, I think we're on to point number six, which is like the, the sixth step is taking personal responsibility. You can't blame someone else for not you not having taken the actions that you plan to take. Completely. I mean, it, and this is this is by this is this is a huge one as well, of course, because it's so easy for for individuals to blame the economy, the economy, their boss, um, the products or services that they're selling. Um, you know, there's a you know the reason that they're overweight. I, you know, I always find it remarkable that in some of the papers that people are attempting to blame the government for the fact that they might be overweight. You know. Um, you know, people aren't forcing food into those individuals that are perhaps obese, uh, for, as an example. You know, so it's about being aware of taking 100% responsibility for everything that's showing up in your life right now. I'm thinking, as you're saying that, if we go back to some of the other steps, that actually, if you haven't done the sort of the, the knowing yourself and defining your purpose, taking personal responsibility is, is that much more difficult. But actually, if you have defined, you know, you know yourself, you defined your purpose, you've worked out what it is that you want, you're an authentic person, you've taken some actions, the personal responsibility should just fall into place. Completely, really. That's yes. The thing. We're really, we're really good, and including myself, by the way, uh, we're really good at not looking in the mirror and taking a hundred percent personal responsibility, you know, for everything that's showing up in our life. You know, the re quality of relationships that we have with our people at work, um, our relationships at home. You know, there's a whole, you know, the list is endless, and it's about looking in the mirror and doing the mirror work and saying, okay, this is completely on me. And, and again, Mark's got great examples around this, so I'll, I'll uh, let Mark share his, well, some of them. I can tell you, just in case you haven't looked in the mirror this morning, Jim, you've got a bald head still, just in case. <laughs> you just... And I'm going to own that. I'm going to own that. <laughs> yeah, no, I, 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 I've, I've seen a lot of people in my career that um, will look in the mirror and you know they, they they don't commit to stuff, so it's almost like their their saying becomes, "Well, I never committed, so I never failed." And I think you know we need to, if, unless you commit to something, you don't find something out about yourself. Um, and we're we're all very good at blaming other people for for our, our problems, our misgivings, or why something went wrong. It was always somebody else's fault, and sometimes it may well be, but then it's up to them to take responsibility for that. And we don't have to become a you know a victim in the blame culture. Um, with swimming, I sort of you know always thought about controlling the controllables. If I looked in the mirror first of all, I knew I'd done everything possible, so I couldn't ask any more of myself. Um, but control the controllables in terms of in in the pool, it was just me in two lanes. I sort of say me, water, and wall at the other end. There was no one else in the race, and I could only um, affect myself. So instead of looking and focusing on anybody else, focus on myself, focus on my own name. If something happened, for example, and my goggles broke, well, I have a what-if scenario, well, I have another pair. I can control the controllables. Um, but if, you know, for some, for example, someone fell in and did a full start, there's nothing I can do about that. But I just got on focusing very much on myself and taking responsibility and a big bit of responsibility for me. And if everyone else takes responsibility for their parts, then the machine works properly. I'm thinking that one of the things you're saying is that you're in the pool, it's you, the water, the wall at the other end. Yeah. And I'm, in many ways, sometimes, you know, you you were not, you didn't mention the other competitors. Right? No. It's you, the water, the wall, um, the turn, getting back. It's about you and the time, you against the clock, not you against the other competitors. No. No, and also with, with with people in work, you know, your you, your competitors a lot of the time, like competitive businesses, of course there are, and you want to be better than them. But ultimately, within a business, you're all working as a team. Ultimately, teamwork's a huge, huge thing. But that's why I say, within a team, if everyone does their part, the team works more efficiently. The team works better, and you do get better results. But yeah, ultimately, I when I was on the block, there was no one else in the race. It was just me because it was all about when I hit the other end. Um, regardless of however fast anybody else 
has gone, I can only affect my result. And if I win on the day, wonderful. Or it went, ultimately, it's, you know, about being doing the best time that I could do. Right. Because I think in business and in work environments, we very often think about what do we have to do to be better than somebody else? Mm. Rather, how do we, what do we have to do in order to be the best that we can be? Right? And letting somebody else be the best that they can be should help us being the best as well. It's, it's. I've just had a, a, a road to Damascus type of moment in that it's not about competing with what somebody else does because they do what they, we have to believe almost that they might have gone through this process and they're doing what they do as well as they can do it. It's yeah. about finding whether you're a one-man band or BP, Shell, Glaxo, Smith, Klein, whatever. It's about finding the thing that you do well and excelling at that, not trying to be the the same as someone else or just a little bit better than someone else. Do what is taking responsibility for what you are good at and excelling at that. Yeah, being as Mark said already, Michael, which is being the best version, the best possible version of yourself, um, is what this is all about. And that's that. This taking a hundred percent personal responsibility will help shape and sculpt that best version of yourself yeah but of course the big challenge i suppose in, in part of that is almost um dis identifying what is not what you're not going to be best at and working out how you find those things which is part of the other steps i suppose and then saying right okay somebody else can do that i'm going to focus on these things this is where i'm going to excel this is my specialism the thing that makes me unique the things that i can be personally responsible for yeah 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 i mean we, we, we there have been loads of books. You've got books uh, at home, Michael, that you've read. I've, I've read a number of books. There was a book written some time ago about don't sweat the small stuff. Um, and we're really good human beings. We're, we're so good at getting wound up and upset about tiny, tiny little things, infuriated, in fact. So this is about being aware and, as I say, take personal responsibility for how you handle those curveballs and all the other life events that show up on a daily basis. Yeah, I'm reminded uh, about an England football match. I don't know who they were playing, but it came down to penalties and um, the other team won. No. But um, the England football team, if I remember correctly, said it wasn't their fault. It was that the penalty spot was, there was something wrong with the with the spot on the, on the pitch where the ball was that caused it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's always a reason, isn't there? <laughs> always a reason. But actually, you know, you just hit the ball wrong or you hit the ball into the wrong place. It's like it's down to you. Well, taking know, responsibility. you see it a lot with managers, don't you? I mean, Jose Mourinho is always like, oh, it's the referee or it's this or it's that. It's like, well, no, do you know what? You know, take, take responsibility. Take it on the chin. This is you and your team. It's your, it's your making. This isn't otherwise, yeah. quite funnily enough, every, every week that is making excuses. Why? Well, sorry, blaming something else or somebody else for why they didn't win. And when you yeah. do win, he goes, aren't oh, no, I amazing? Oh, wow, yeah. that's a lot of ego stuff going on there. <laughs> true, true. You could spend a lot of time on that, but it's it's almost like the we're talking. There's lots of talk at the moment about all this, like being in the moment and and focusing on various different things. And I think talking to to, to you both today, I'm starting to understand more about what this being in the present and dealing with things now um, actually starts to mean. And it's it's sort of like the you can see the whole picture of of individuals teams and organizations developing so that you can it's like deal with the present um, what does it mean in terms of your eight steps this this uh, idea of being in the present i mean the the in vogue term at the moment um that's swinging around the corporate world is mindfulness and it's the yeah. same thing as being present so being present of the fingerprint that you're leaving in every interaction. So how aware are you of the interaction that you've just had with that team member or your colleague uh, within uh, your, your team or even at home with the kids, you know? So what sort of fingerprint are you leaving as we skip along on our busy, you know, next, 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 next pace? So it's about being present to that, but also being present and aware of how you you know how you're showing up you know you go from one meeting so i see it so so much in the corporate world you know a leader will go from one meeting that's been quite tense and and you know um fraught and they'll they'll take that energy into the next meeting so it's about being aware taking a breath 
slowing down and getting yourself centered before you lean into the next thing. And I suppose the, those few seconds on the block before you enter the pool to like swim, that you have to leave what happened an hour ago away and just focus on that particular challenge at that particular time. Well, that you, must... you hear people talk about, you know, being in the now, and the now is ultimately they're sort of in the zone, and that's when you're completely present and it kind of what uh i suppose the easiest way of thinking about it is you, you shut off all the you, you shut the mind off and it's by by concentrating on your breath i mean my race was only 21 seconds but we don't breathe but by concentrating on the breath and slowing it and almost shutting everything else off it's just being very very present so i'd sit behind the block and concentrate i'd probably go through the race a couple of times and like i mentioned earlier earlier on always envisage a positive result but just by concentrating on my breath and being in the moment I was completely luckily present and I've been on the block several times before before where I kind of was so the mind was flying all over the place and I was trying to make things happen that I you I tried too hard so yeah concentrating on the breath and just letting them shutting everything else off and being present and being in the moment because I think in the corporate workplace um, with everyone, you know, with everyone going to back-to-back -back meetings, there's so much press, pressure to get more from less. It's, you know, it's no wonder that people find it very, very, very difficult to be present uh, and get that sort of competitive advantage. Yeah, I suppose even just that one telephone call goes wrong, you you take that same attitude to the next telephone call without taking the time to mm. it's almost like just calm down, center yourself, and then to give the next person that you interact with an experience which is is for want of a better expression, fair to them. And yeah, giving them full, full, full attention. We've all had it in terms of, I don't know, in a, being in a meeting, you've got your phone on the table and you're, you're, you're listening and all of a sudden your phone goes and you, you get completely distracted and you, you're, you're so not in that, in that meeting anymore. You get distracted over here and it takes you time to get back up to speed of what's going on. You know? That's an easy thing. Yeah, also though, you're talking about um, getting positive results and I'm Part of me is sort of thinking about these eight steps where you if you if you go through the eight steps, you are going to get a positive result if you commit to them. You know, if you commit to eight steps as, as you're suggesting, you will end up with a positive result. It's it's when you start deviating from the plan, so to speak, that the, the bad things start to happen. Would that absolutely. be right? This, yeah, absolutely. This is this for both Mark and I, if we were ever um, pinned down to what's your one big tip, Mark always comes back with commitment, which it is, you know, and we both agree on this, absolutely, uh, that it's the commitment that people haven't got, that they, you know, they don't commit to seeing it all the way through. You know, they might be looking to uh, lose weight, give up cigarettes, whatever it might be, whatever their goal is, get fit. You know, they, they get to a point where they just sort of are, are almost there, but then they think, ah, oh, well, this isn't too bad. You know, I've lost a few pounds. Um, I'll go back to my previous habits because I, you know, I'm finding this tough. But it's about mm -hmm. committing to seeing it all the way through completion. And, um, you know, I've been privileged to be in this corporate world as a, as a, as a coach for the last 16 years. And, and this is the Achilles heel. This is the thing that lets most people down, you know, the, the lack of commitment to see it all the way through to completion. And, uh, and Mark is a fantastic example of someone that's, you know, stayed very focused and stayed very committed in his career. I mean, you know, what, what you know, most swimmers have, have, have given up their swimming career um, by the age of 24, 25. Um, Mark, Mark carried on. Um, yeah. Well, I think this yeah. ultimately there's no point sort of being half committed to anything i think it's you know you do or you don't do um there's no such thing as sort of try um i think you do or you don't do and I, you know i know you can say oh you never became olympic champion but it never stopped me trying uh, and i never stopped believing and i never stopped committing to it and i think that's why over 23 years and five olympics which should have been six but i won't go into that um <laughs> I never stop trying and never stop believing. And that's, that's why I know that I achieved what I did achieve because I had that, that mindset. I could have quite easily after when I got my first setback, um, gone off and, 
you know, gone, do you know what, this isn't worth it, or it's not working, or uh, I've got lots of friends who over the years are probably more talented than me, but they just didn't work as hard as me, or they didn't commit for long enough. They wanted that instant result, and if they didn't get it, they moved on to something else, and, oh, that's not worth it. And it was something, you know, if you're going to achieve something, that it's, it's worth it's worth waiting for, it's worth committing to. Yeah, I agree with you. I've seen so many cases of people with great qualifications not being accepted for jobs because there was someone else, a candidate with lesser standards of qualifications, less experience, but they had the commitment. They really wanted to do it. And you take that person with their enthusiasm, their commitment, their energy and passion for the job that they're they're applying to do. You take that person rather than the person who's simply got a list of qualifications and, yeah. and lots of behind them. I fully I've seen so that happens so many times. I think that one of the things that I'm thinking is that we've in the last hour we've covered a whole range of different things which you know, if you build it all together, but there must be some part of this which is um, you know, what are the key things? You know, if I if I only have if I only if I convince myself I only have time to focus on a few things, what would those things be within this? The the um, short I, I, yeah, instead of eight, can I do three? <laughs> yeah. um, it's, it's, you know, both Mark and I, when we, when we pulled these together, it was very obvious that the three big ones that we would, we would absolutely say um, that are critical are uh, step one, know yourself. Step mm -hmm. two, know what you want. So what are your goals? And then step eight, commit. And uh, that's the short version, but of course, all the other um, aspects that we've spoken about, the other five steps, as you've uh, as you've spoken, uh, as we've spoken to you, Michael, uh, are also very critical as well, of course. So I, I wouldn't want to lose them, but you know, know yourself, know what you want, and commit is really um, uh, the short and version. Right, the ape steps, like type of thing. The um... We've had an hour today, but um, people can find out more about the Eight Steps to World Class Performance at an event that you're holding in London, and um, you've offered a discount on the price as well. Could you tell us just a little bit more about that event? Yeah, it's a, it's a full day event, both Mark and I are speaking there as well, um, but we've, we've got the CEO of um, JCA, who are the emotional intelligence um, organization that we're partners with, so he's coming along to talk about emotional intelligence. We've got a CEO from uh, Suntory, who is the Lucasade Ribena CEO, and uh, we've got a um, NHR um, specialist that's going to come along and, and talk about, um, you know, building a blueprint for you know su sustainable success in the future. So this goes a lot deeper into the uh, eight steps of world class performance, and um, as you say, we've got an early bird uh, ticket at two fifty, which is reduced from 295. So uh, for those people that are listening today or uh, at, at a future point, that's available until the 14th of October. Okay, we'll send out all the information about that and the code for that as well. But um, thank you very much. Um, there is the longer on, um, on Twitter as well. You can follow the guys there, find out more about what it is that they're doing. We have included a little picture there in the pool as well. Um, you said you didn't breathe in that 21 seconds. It looks as if you're doing a lot of breathing there, Mr. Foster. Um, yeah, that was, yeah, my head's up. A butterfly is a bit different. Oh. <laughs> but also, that's no. probably I was doing 100 metres. You have to start sucking in the air over 100 metres, I tell you, because they chuck an elephant on you back halfway down. <laughs> <laughs> well, Thank you very much. I know we, we've had all sorts of technical issues with this, but um, thank you very much for your time today. It's been great. I've learned an awful lot, and um, hopefully the people that are watching the webinar have learned something. So, um, thank you very much. Have a great.